My name is Dr. Nigel Parker, and I'm a part of a trio of zoologists focusing on fieldwork. With me is Dr. Gemma Stone. You cannot find a more brilliant scientist if you tried. There is also Dr. Travis Ludwig, a silly guy but also quite brilliant. We travel the globe investigating complaints of deviant animal behavior. Our specialty, wolves. Easily one of the most misunderstood animals on the planet. Most people think of wolves as bloodthirsty killing machines, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. They are extraordinary animals with complex pack dynamics. And most importantly, they do not hunt humans. The laws in many regions prohibited the hunting of wolves. But every once in a while, wolves would attack a human. The people of the surrounding area would demand that the wolves would be put down, but needed to go through the proper channels, so that's where my team comes in. We would evaluate the targeted packs and see if putting them down was acceptable. So far, we have found a lot of human problems opposed to wolf problems. We saw cases where parents let their young children wander unsupervised into the wilderness, where they would stumble upon a den of pups. They would want to play with them, which would result in the wrath of the mother wolf. We found a subpar fencing around farms where wolves would attack cattle or chickens. The farmers were instructed to build better protective barriers and of course, the attacks would stop. We had yet to find these bloodthirsty evil wolves that we were always promised. Instead, we found wild animals being wild animals. Educating the humans that tended to be the best defense. This current call was a little strange. We were in a small town in northern Alaska, and the people were terrified. A large portion of the population had abandoned their homes and left the town to stay with relatives. Those that had nowhere to go had boarded up their windows and doors. The report given to us on the journey there said that the wolves of the area had been attacking and even killing people unprovoked. There were even sworn cases of wolves breaking down doors to get into houses. None of this made sense. Travis suggested that we were dealing with a high level of hysteria, and the claims were being blown out of proportion, so Gemma and I agreed. We had never heard of wolves acting this way. Still, we tried to keep an open mind as going in with biases went against the scientific method. We were just about to arrive in the town. Signing out, Nigel. Log 2 We have been stationed in one of the abandoned homes for a couple of days now. It's a two-story home, it's quite nice. The snow is definitely falling, leaving quite the chill in the air. So far, there have been no signs of any wolves. We still came prepared with tranquilizer dart guns on the off chance of a confrontation. We also have lots of canned food to keep us satiated. Signing out, Nigel. Log 3. I'm in shock. Travis is dead. We were outside when the wolves came like a swarm. We had our guns on us at all times, but when we shot at the wolves, it didn't seem to do anything. We ran back into the house, but a gray wolf had grabbed Travis by the leg. He was yanked down and torn apart. Oh, the screams. I can't get the screams out of my head. They were screams of pain, screams of death. We ran inside and grabbed our things, ready to make a run to the car, but to our dismay, the wolves did not leave, well, not all of them. We could count to five that seemed to just be waiting on us. One was even laying in the hood of the car, and we were trapped. We could see Travis's mangled body in the snow, limbs barely holding onto his torso. We were just thankful that his face was looking in the opposite direction, so we couldn't see the look of horror that had to be on it. When we got busy pulling floorboards up into barricading the doors and the windows as best as we could. We tried calling for help, but there was no reception. We just sat in silence after that. Gemma broke the silence suddenly when she said, They're aggressive. She had a look of deep thought on her face. Yeah, no crap, I said sarcastically. 
No, think about it, she said. When they killed Travis. I don't want to talk about this, I interrupted. Oh, too bad, she snapped. When they killed Travis, they ripped him apart, but then what did they do? They set their sights on us, I said, still not seeing her point. Exactly. They left the body alone and they didn't eat him. They aren't hunting for food. Understanding was dawning on me. Oh, well, then why attack at all? They wouldn't have felt threatened as they came after us. They killed for the sake of killing. She finished my thought. That doesn't make any sense, I said. Wolves don't do that. There's a fact that we're not looking at. Certain diseases in humans can cause heightened levels of adrenaline. I think that these wolves are sick and that it's leading to this odd behavior. It would explain why our tranks didn't work. We need to get back to the lab and return with a more prepared team to get some DNA samples and see what's causing this behavior. One problem with your plan, I said. How are we getting out of here? Log 4 it's been two weeks and the wolves haven't left. We've noticed that they've been taking shifts so that they can be well rested. They've tried breaking in on multiple occasions but the barricades have stayed firm. Still, a new danger has arrived. Hunger. We are running out of food. We now have a choice. Starve or take our chances with the wolves. We need to make a break for it, Gemma argued, before we lose our strength. We have a chance of surviving the pack. We have no chance surviving starvation. I was in agreement, but we needed a plan. We needed to just make it to the car, but we need protection. We went into the kitchen where we found the biggest knives that we could find. Next, we broke off the banister, creating two large rods. We found duct tape and attached the knives to the rods. And there we had it. DIY spears. Gemma and I looked at each other. This was our only chance, as slim as it was, and we had to take it. I write this log knowing that it may be my last. If you don't hear from me again, then you know. Well, you just know. Hoping this isn't my last goodbye. Update. New log. My name is Dr. Garrett Parker. I'm the younger brother of the late Nigel Parker. Growing up, Nigel and I always had a love for animals, and it transcended into our careers. Nigel became a zoologist and I became a veterinarian. I am currently the head of veterinarian at the Los Alamitos Zoo in California. Nigel and I always used to debate about who had the cooler job. He argued that his job was better because he got to travel around the world as saving wildlife. I argued that I had the better job because... I got to work one on one with some of the world's most exotic animals and never had to leave the comforts of a sunny California. God, I was going to miss those arguments. Now my brother was gone. He had went on an expedition with two of his colleagues and never came back. Only Dr. Gemma Stone had survived the expedition and the story she told would haunt me forever. We had almost fought our way to the car when... A particularly large wolf lunged at me. She had recalled tearfully. Nigel stabbed the wolf in its side which saved me, but it left him wide open for another wolf to lunge at him. There was so much blood and I realized that the wolf had gone for the throat. The look in Nigel's eyes screamed, Go! I made it to the car and drove as quickly as I could, leaving the wolves and Nigel's body behind. Log 2 after Nigel's funeral, Gemma reached out to me and told me about the oddly aggressive behaviors of the wolves. By her description, I had to agree that something was off with it. Her hypothesis that the wolf suffered from some sort of ailment did fit, and I was determined to get to the bottom of this. Gemma had originally contacted me so I could suggest a colleague to start a study on these wolves, but that wasn't going to happen. I was going to be handling this myself. I needed to know why my brother was dead. And at the risk of bragging, I am one of the best in my field. I set up a task force equipped to handle the situation. Their objective was to bring one of the wolves to me. 
I wanted a full workup on this animal that could only be done with a 24-hour observation. I prescribed much stronger tranquilizers and the team was armored and tasked with a variety of weapons. It took a week, but a wolf was captured with a minimal injury to the team. The wolf was an adult male with white and gray fur. We named him Vlad after Vlad the Impaler due to his bloodthirsty nature. I was informed that even with the nearly lethal dosage of the trank, he still remained conscious, though a little bit loopy. At first, he was quite aggressive when he had arrived at the lab, lunging at the bars of his cage. Whether this was his normal behavior or reaction to his change of scenery was yet unknown. A noose-like apparatus with a metal rod was used to hold him down, as a blood sample was taken. I wanted everything looked at. It would take a couple of days before the blood panel came back. It was getting later in the day and it was time to feed Vlad. The zoo had a specially formulized kibble for wolves in observation. The bull was pushed into his cage. Don't worry about his appetite, as he is unlikely to eat for a while, I told my team. Vlad has never seen kibble and as such won't immediately recognize it as food. I finished off slowly. The wolf hadn't so much as sniffed the food before digging in. It was as if he ate kibble every day. Just another oddity to add to Vlad's list. Hopefully the blood test would shine some light on Vlad's behaviors. Log 3 Vlad was nothing like we thought he would be. I had worked with wolves before and it was apparent that Vlad was much more docile than the average wolf. It contradicted his behavior in the wild. Gemma was in the lab when the blood test came back and the results were shocking. Vlad's hormonal levels were all normal. He did not have adrenaline spikes. His white blood cell count was normal, indicating that he wasn't or hadn't been fighting off any form of infection. The disease panel came up clear. This was a perfectly healthy wolf. I was beginning to think the group had captured the only healthy wolf in the pack. When I flipped to the last page of the report, I stared in shock. A drug panel found that he had tested positive for dryptofam. I said in shock. Dryptofam, Gemma replied. She knew what it was and we both did. It was a synthetic trank blocker used to wake large animals up after surgeries. Well, this explains his reaction, or the lack thereof, to the guns that we used. I said, nausea was coming over me as a disturbing truth was making itself known. This wolf was raised by a human, I said. It's the only thing that makes any sense. It explains why he's been so docile. It explains his familiarity with kibble, not to mention the drugs. But then why attack humans when in his pack? Wouldn't he be more comfortable with humans? Gemma asked. Not of the person who trained him didn't want him to be. Whoever raised him trained him to hunt humans, I continued. Oh, we're looking at a serial killer. Log 4. Behavioral analysts from the FBI had taken over my lab. When I first had contacted the FBI, they thought that this was all a joke. A killer using wolves to do its work. They thought that I was full of it. Thankfully, I came across Agent Granger, and he was a respected, reasonable man, who had seen more than anyone should. He kept me on as an expert of wildlife. Agent Granger started the investigation by seeing if there were any non-wolf-related deaths that seemed strange in and around the small Alaskan town. A man doesn't just start raising wolves to kill people without using another method first. He needs a payoff. And there are hundreds of ways that you could get it quicker than raising a wolf pup and training it to kill, Granger said. At first glance, they didn't see anything abnormal, until they looked about 15 years in the past. The town had been plagued by a mysterious killer who would stab his victims. He seemed to prefer adult women, but wasn't above killing anyone really. He had quite the rare pathology, whoever he was. His reign of terror lasted for eight years, only to abruptly stop. It was most likely that he had died. A man this sick doesn't just stop if he has any choice. 
This was the only abnormality in and around that town in over 50 years. Agent Granger was certain that the two cases were connected. The main question was, how? Log 5 Agent Granger found the smoking gun, so to speak. A couple of miles away from the town was an old coal mine. Part of the mine had collapsed, killing three and seriously injuring one, and the mine was closed down. Why this was important was because this accident had happened exactly 15 years ago, right when the killings had stopped. It would make sense that one of the deceased men had been the murderer. To try to pinpoint which one of the men was the killer, the agent contacted the only surviving victim of the mine collapse. His name was Arthur Brown, and he invited us into his home. He lived a couple of miles away from the town in a small cabin. Granger and I rode together to the small dwelling. Mr. Brown greeted us kindly. He was paralyzed from the waist down due to the accident. We walked up the ramp to his porch and went into his house. Mr. Brown was in his 70s. He had warm brown eyes and a kind smile. What little hair he had still was as white as the snow surrounding his house. Oh, sorry if this place is messy, he said. My wife Loretta kept things clean, but she died almost 25 years ago, and I never truly got as good as she was at keeping the clutter at bay. He looked sad. Oh, she was my rock, the absolute best thing in my whole life. She died of a heart condition when I was still mining at the Williams Mine. This was before the collapse. He rambled. It was clear that he wasn't used to company. He probably wanted to share all his life with anyone that would listen. Mr. Brown, the agent cut in gently. Uh, we're sorry to bother you, but we've come looking for information about the murders that spanned from 23 to 15 years ago. Do you recall them? Oh yes, terrible. It was as if I heard another horror story from one of my mining buddies every week, he stated. Well, that's just it. Granger spoke gingerly. We have a suspicion that one of your fellow miners was the cause of all that horror. Mr. Brown looked aghast. Oh, you must be mistaken. We miners might have looked tough back in our prime, but we never heard a fly. These were good men. Family men. He defended desperately. Well, we have no doubt that they were great men, Granger appeased, but please think. Three men died in that accident. Out of those men, did any of them ever strike you as odd? Oh, no, no. Well, there was Barry, Barry Larson, Mr. Brown clarified. He was always quiet, but sometimes he... Oh, sir, I don't want to speak ill of the dead. Please, Granger said firmly. This is important. Well, Mr. Brown said, sometimes old Barry would turn right mean. He had a temper problem. He would punch things in anger. His knuckles were often bruised or cut up. Does Mr. Larson have any living kin? Why, yes, I think so. He had a brother who also worked in the mines. Um, John was his name. Oh, he and Barry had the same problem with anger. I'd be careful knocking on John's door. Log 6 Agent Granger and I were coming to the same conclusion. John was our person of interest. Granger wanted a question but felt that it wouldn't be safe for me to come along. Mr. Brown offered for me to stay the night. He had a spare bedroom and, quite frankly, it was hard to say no to the sweet old man. I agreed and he acted as if it was the greatest news he had ever heard. And Granger went out of his way and Mr. Brown led me to the spare bedroom. It was cozy with a quilt covered bed and a bookcase filled with bugs. I'll let you get comfortable. How about I put in some tea? It always warms me up. Mr. Brown offered. Yeah, thank you. I obliged and he wheeled off, leaving me into the room. I went to the bookcase, having a feeling that I would be reading that night since I noted the absence of a TV. I looked at the books and my skin went cold. Most of them had a similar title. How to Train Your Dog Log 7 I am alone in a cabin with a deranged serial killer. What do I do? 
I can make a run for it, but he has wolves that are trained to hunt down humans. I go for my phone to call Agent Granger. No signal. Gemma had warned me about this. T's ready. I nearly jumped out of my skin at the sound of Mr. Brown's voice. He was in the doorway with a platter in his lap with two cups of tea and some sugar. My mind was racing. He didn't know that. I knew he was the killer. I needed to act normal. The big question I had was, should I take the tea? Poisoning me would do no good since he was trying to look innocent. And the tea was probably safe. At the same time, this man was deranged and I didn't feel comfortable with the odds of probably... I'm actually not feeling so good. I think I might take a nap, I said. No, the tea will help you relax, he replied. Oh, no, that's okay, I said. He looked very confused. And that's when I made the dumbest decision of my life. I glanced at the bookshelf. I didn't mean to, but I couldn't undo it. Mr. Brown's face changed to one of a grim understanding. He moved his torso forward and away from his wheelchair and reached behind his back before grabbing a shotgun. My blood ran cold. You're a smart one, you know. Now I have to get rid of you before your agent friend gets back. I want you to put your hands on your head. We're headed for the mines. The mines, I questioned. It's where I keep the wolves, he said with a smile. My heart jolted. I was going to die just like Nigel. Panic was making everything spin. Put the gun down. Had I imagined the voice, it sounded like Agent Granger. I looked up and sure enough, there is Granger with a gun of his own aimed at the back of Mr. Brown's head. The old man's smile faltered as he realized that he was caught. How did you know? He asked. Don't oh, trust me, there'll be plenty of time for talking, but first, you're going to put that gun down. Mr. Brown didn't move. You know, Granger said in a steely voice, we're not so different, you and I. We have both killed before, and we both are just fine doing it again. I'll say it one more time, and then I shoot. Put the gun down. Mr. Brown hesitated before finally listening. The relief I felt was overwhelming. Granger coughed Mr. Brown's hands behind his wheelchair. Case solved. Log 8. Agent Granger had driven halfway to question the new suspect when the reality of who was really to blame dawned on him. Granger explained to me how he realized that Brown was the culprit. It was two things actually. The first thing was that none of his windows and doors were boarded like everyone else's. He was unafraid of the wolves. Second, the death of Mrs. Brown coincided with the beginning of the killings all those years ago. The interrogation of Arthur Brown helped explain this in further detail. Loretta was my rock, Mr. Brown had said. My voice had the urge to kill, but there was something about it that kept it at bay. I wasn't willing to do anything to risk screwing up what we had. And then she was gone. My everything was gone, and I had no reason to hold back anymore. He continued. I killed so many, and I loved it. It was euphoric. I carried on for eight years until that mine collapsed and left me in this chair, and I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't wrestle anyone to the ground. I couldn't flee the scene. I thought that it was all over. And then one day, I saw a wolf that had obviously just killed its prey. Blood was dripping from its muzzle, and it gave me an idea. So I set up traps, got myself a male and a female, and waited for them to breed. They had five pups, and I had five weapons that I kept breeding the wolves, all while training them. I killed the original two, only leaving wolves who knew me as their alpha. He was so smug, it was obvious that he was impressed with himself. I trained them to knock down doors, and I trained them to kill. Finally, I had a pack of killer wolves 100% devoted to me, and I set them loose. This chair couldn't stop me. Nothing could stop me. Well, I stopped you, was all that Agent Granger said before leaving the man alone in the interrogation room. Log 9 I observed Brown's wolves for quite a long time. Some of the more docile ones, like Vlad, 
were sent to different zoos and sanctuaries. The untrained pups were taught the fundamental ways of survival and to release back into the wild. The rest of them sadly had to be put down. Animals I get, even the most terrifying of beasts have a sanity about them. Humans I will never understand. They are the true beasts in this world. I went back home and on with my life. I did it, Nigel. Now I hope you can rest in peace.